Welcome back to Codex. Today marks one year since we launched this seminar, and to celebrate, we get to hear from Professor Radu Balan from the University of Maryland College Park. Radu studied with Ingrid Dobishi at Princeton until receiving his PhD in Applied and Computational Mathematics in 1998. After a brief stint as an IMA postdoc, he then worked at Siemens before moving to Maryland in 2007. Over this period, his influential research has developed the mathematics of signal processing and data science in applications like blind source separation, phase retrieval, and deep learning. Today, Professor Balan will speak to us about his recent work on metric embeddings of matrix spaces modulo actions of the symmetric group. Take it away, Radu. Justin, thank you so much for the introduction and thank you the organizers for inviting me here to the, give a talk, Joey, John, Emily, and uh, Dustin. Thank you all for the opportunity. So indeed, today I'd like to uh, talk about uh, uh, this topic about metric spaces and embedding Euclidean embeddings of metric spaces in use by permutation group. So just to give you, okay, acknowledgements, first of all, thanks the uh, sponsors. And this is a joint work with Navid Hagani, my former student at UMD, now at APL. And uh, part of the work you mentioned is with uh, Stratos Tukanis, who's a, a graduate student at Maryland, as well as our industrial collaborator, Mani Singh from Mobilis. So just to give you an idea about uh, the, the topic and the type of problems we'll be looking at today. So consider a uh, linear space capital V a vector space, which is finite dimensional, and the permutation group, uh, this uh, script S sub N. We, um, we are going to consider a couple of actions or representations of this permutation group on the, uh, on the linear space V. Each such action, each representation induces a quotient space, the space of orbits, and then uh, and on the orbit space, if you want, you have a, a metric, there is a natural induced metric on that one. And what we're interested in is, uh, is in Euclidean embeddings of this quotient space. Specifically, there are three types of actions that we'll be uh, interested in. One is consider V the space of, uh, say, tall matrices, n by D, n rows, D columns, and uh, a permutation matrix pi this time. So the, instead of the permutation, uh, the symmetric group SN, I'm gonna consider the group of permutation matrices. Pi acts on X by multiplication on left. So what it does is just a row permutation of the matrix S. The second action is on the space of symmetric matrices and is uh, just a, a similarity transformation or a conjugation. You take the symmetric matrix A and multiply with this permutation matrix pi, left and right, pi A pi transpose. It's like a change of coordinates. I mean, it is a change of coordinates, except that it is performed by a permutation matrix, not by a generic or invertible matrix or unitary matrix. Okay, and the third uh, type of action representation this act on a product of these two spaces, symmetric matrices cross uh, n by d uh, matrices. And what it does, you take a pair x and uh, returns this pair. So you conjugate a with a matrix pi, pi a pi transpose. And on the data matrix x, the second factor, you multiply on the left by pi. Okay. I'm going to try to justify each of these uh, representation, why we're looking at this, and uh, you know what are the use cases. And as I mentioned, the, the problem is to find, to construct, if possible, a by Lipschitz embedding of the quotient space into Euclidean space Rn. Ultimately, that's what we want. We want to find the dimension M as well as be explicitly this embedding. Okay. And here is just a pictorial view of what this is. So you initially have the space V. This is the linear space, but you have the orbits for each element X. You have the equivalence class, which uh, represent the uh, the set of of, uh, of points X uh, that you act on by the permutation matrix pi. This is your orbit, okay? And you have a collection of orbits now in the orbit space. This defines a quotient space. And what our embedding represents is that this entire class, the equivalence class, we associate one n-dimensional vector in Rn, alpha, alpha of X. The same for Y, another point alpha of Y. And being Lipschitz or by Lipschitz, by Lipschitz to say that the natural distance between these orbits is somewhat equivalent to the Euclidean uh, distance between alpha x and alpha y. There are constants that control above and below the difference 
distance here and this one there. Okay, we're gonna make this in, uh, more precise in a little while. Okay, so that's kind of the overview as what we want. Okay, and the, here's kind of the list of, uh, of specific topics. We'll see if we have time to go through all of them. So we're gonna spend a bit of time on the first uh, invading. This is R and by, okay, so I'm gonna start with motivation, of course, why, what are those used for? But then we're gonna spend some time on this uh, set of tall matrices and by D, and we're gonna analyze two type of invading, the polynomial invading and the protein based invading, I call them. And then uh, I would like to spend a little bit of time on this other space, the space of symmetric matrices, uh, where the N by N. That's it. It's very interesting and, uh, you know, has, has, I think, quite a lot of uh, opportunities and a lot of work can be done there. And then I'm going to show some uh, numerical examples uh, uh, of the type of embedding we're looking for. Okay. All right. So, motivation. Uh, well, the first slide is about similarity by saying that uh, if you have two, for instance, symmetric matrices, one natural question is to know when there exists an orthogonal matrix or an uh, orthonormal change of coordinates that brings one matrix into the other. That is to say, when you can get B equal to U, A, U transpose, right? By an orthogonal change of coordinates. It's actually relatively elementary to show that uh, this equivalence, that is matrices A and B are equivalent modulo an orthogonal transformation if and only if A and B have the same set of eigenvalues with exactly the same multiplicity. In other words, it's, uh, it's sufficient to have uh, exactly the same, um, uh, the same uh, uh, characteristic polynomial. A and B should have the same characteristic uh, polynomial. Okay. Now, the problem I'm, in, uh, I'm posing here, and one way to look at the derivations we, we are doing here is that what if you replace a set of uh, the group of orthogonal matrices by you know, another another group or a subgroup in this case. And specifically, I'm looking at the subgroup of, of permutation matrices, right, a sub -band. And the question is, when, what are necessary and sufficient conditions so that two matrices, two parenthesis symmetric matrices are equivalent modulo permutation? And what a permutation does, you simultaneously permit the rows and the columns in the same way, right, and takes you from one to the other. Now, it's conceivable that such a problem is solvable in a finite number of operations. I mean, there are so finitely many permutations and factorial. So in, in theory, you could, I mean, in the abstract, you can check all the n factorial permutations, see if one gives you equality or not, right? But obviously the, the more interesting problem is to do, to solve such, a, such an equivalence uh, much faster than exhaustive the sets of the n factorial right? permutations. Now, uh, the set of permutation matrices uh, can be sort of in multiple ways. Here are two ways you can think of it. One is a set of orthogonal matrices that have entries 0 or 1. So if you, you know, constrain this, that each entry can only be 0 or 1, and you put the orthogonal condition, uh, matrix condition, you end up with permutations. And the second one, the, uh, the permutation matrices end up to be the intersection between, that is to say, there are matrices that are simultaneously orthogonal as well as doubly stochastic. And that's what the second set here says. The entries in Ws are from zero to one in this interval and row sum is one, column sum is one, okay? In fact, uh, Birkhoff theorem uh, tells us that the permutation matrices are exactly the extreme points of this convex set of double stochastic matrices. Okay? That, that's an observation useful in optimizations and we might be able to try to sum from that. Okay, uh, now why is that in particular interesting, that particular problem, equivalent model of permutations? Well, there is this graph isomorphism problem that's been around for quite a while. And what the problem is, is the following. If you are given two graphs, let's say with the same number of nodes n, okay, the problem is to, uh, it's a computation problem of determining whether these graphs are identical after relabeling of nodes, right? In other words, if you relabel the node, if you permit the nodes in the in the graph G, do you get G tilde or vice versa? Okay, and that it it ends up to be the same as saying that if A and A tilde do not be adjacency matrices, well, these graphs are isomorphic if and only if there is a permutation matrix pi such that A tilde is pi A pi transpose. We conjugate A with pi. And you have to end up with the other adjacent symmetry. Okay. And this is uh, still an open problem. I just uh, you know, copied down from Wikipedia. 
So a very nice result by Babai a couple of years back. He found a, and presented a quasi-polynomial algorithm with running time, you know, the two to the power, it says, or the log m to power c. And about the same year, uh, Helgut, Helgut said that c, you can take c to be three. So that's, that's uh, my understanding that that's kind of the uh, state of the art as far as algorithms and whether the problem is uh, solvable, right, in, in polynomial time or not. Okay, and obviously you can extend and uh, reformulate the problem, not only with adjacent symmetrices, whose entries are zero or one, but you can look at uh, weighted graphs, in which case, and A and, and tilde are symmetric matrices. You, without lots of general, you can assume that, for instance, no negative entries you can add the you know, same constant to everybody to make them fast but non negative, right? And, and then you have this isomorphism and only be, again, one a tilde or uh, one weight matrix is uh, conjugate uh, by a permutation of the other uh, weight matrix. Okay, there's a graph isomorphism. Uh, again, another problem closely related is a graph alignment problem. And now, you know, assume that you have two symmetric matrices A and B, same size and by n. And in the alignment problem, uh, if you think of A and B as quadratic forms, you want to find an orthogonal matrix U or N that minimizes the Frobenius norm of the difference. The graph isomorphism and in fact, the first equivalence problems ask whether this uh, minimum is zero or not, right? But here is actually, we want more than that. Even if it's not minimum, find the minimum distance. And you can uh, expand this Frobenius norm square and eventually end up with a trace of this uh, UAU transpose B. Minimizing the left-hand side eventually means maximizing the trace on the right-hand side. Well, it actually, uh, if you want to optimize over U orthogonal matrices, there is a very nice closed form expression. And I'm writing here the, uh, the, the expression of the optimal U that aligns one into the other. Uh, is based on the eigen decomposition of these two matrices A and B. And the Frobenius norm, so the smallest uh, distance between the matrices, is based on the Euclidean norm uh, uh, of the difference between ordered set of eigenvalues in one matrix and the other matrix, right? Lambda k minus mu k. Elton norm or Elton norm square gives you the minimum on the left hand side. Okay. So everything works well and it's easy to, to do it as long as you let the uh, U matrix to be an orthogonal matrix. Another problem, uh, an interesting problem is that what if you constrain instead of using any orthogonal matrix, if you constrain to permutation, to the group of permutation matrices. Well, in this case, you end up with what is known as a graph matching problem because you basically want to match vertices from, uh, let's say graph uh, to the adjacent matrices A to nodes, whose adjacent symmetric C is represented by B, and you want to minimize uh, the number of mismatches counted basically through the number of edges, right? You want to, to maximize uh, the, uh, rather you want to minimize the number of edges that show up in one graph, but not in the other graph, right? And, and if you, so the optimization uh, is as before is minimum Frobenius norm of this difference, but this time around you optimize over permutation matrices instead of orthogonal matrices. Okay, and, uh, and again, the, the minimum ends up to be equivalent to maximizing the trace of this matrix. Well, this is known, I mean, either one is known as a quadratic assignment problem. Uh, unlike the linear assignment problem that uses only one permutation matrix, this uses two, so it's a product involving two permutation matrices that, that is a quadratic in the permutation matrix U, uh, and that's why it's called quadratic assignment. Problem. Okay. And, and uh, again, and maximize trace or minimizing the Frobenius norm of the difference is equivalent to minimize the, or computing, in fact, the natural distance between the equivalent classes of matrices A and B, right? Where the equivalence class is a minimum Frobenius norm here distance uh, between representatives from one class and representatives from the other class. Right, if you minimize over two P and Q permutation matrices, in fact, it's the same as minimizing over one of, you know, fixing one Q to the identity and letting P, for instance, run. And that's exactly what this uh, minimum 
that the optimization problem before was to compute this natural distance between equivalence classes. So the graph isomorphism can be understood as uh, deciding testing whether the distance is zero or not by this natural distance. Okay, um, so that's you know another motivation. And finally, why to look at those uh, kind of joint matrix A and the uh, matrix X? Well, this came actually from graph learning problems. When in a data graph, I'm saying here you have two pieces of information. You have an graph adjacency or a weight matrix A, that's a symmetric one, and the data matrix where at every node in your graph you have a vector, let's say, of length B. Um, I kind of realized later in my talk that uh, the same D would denote also the distance and the, you know, the size of this vector, hopefully, will become apparent from the context. Which we see. So, um, so you have the, the graph, again, the graph adjacency and the data matrix for a given data graph. And in some problems, not all problems, but some problems are uh, to uh, perform other classification or regression on graphs, meaning that you are given a graph of such a data graph and you want to return one value. So the value is per graph, it's not per node. It's not a node labeling, it's not, you know, some other kind of uh, missing nodes. To, I mean, there are all sorts of uh, graph learning problems, but this is, I'm looking at this type of specific problem where you want to construct, you, you want to, to, to uh, solve a task, a learning task that associates one result per graph, not per node. For instance, in classification, you want to associate one class to the entire graph. So you have a finite set of values, finite set of classes, and you want to decide your graph belongs to which class. In regression, you want to perhaps uh, predict, estimate a value like a real number, again, given the entire graph. Right? Now, in such problems, it's, it's often the case, and in fact, it's pretty much uh, all the problems I'm thinking of, I, they satisfy this invariance. Are supposed to, your, your result should, is supposed to be invariant to uh, relabeling the nodes. Meaning that if I label my nodes, if I if I put the one to n labels uh, to different, you know, in a different order, on my nodes, I should end up with the same result. That means that the function f should be invariant to this type of conjugation. For every permutation matrix, if you replace A by PAT transpose and the data set X by PX, the result should not change. All right. So this type of invariance was actually the kind of the reason and the starting point as to why we were in fact looking at uh, this uh, quotient spaces. And then Euclidean, the Euclidean embedding comes as a natural question, what would be the a latent representation of this data graph? Something that which is, you know, compatible to the input data. Uh, that would be the value chip problem. Okay, and uh, now to be more specific and the results, numerical results we're gonna show later, uh, hopefully, we're looking at this uh, uh, graph uh, convolutive network or graph neural network architecture. And so this is just like in a nutshell, uh, how does uh, DCN looks like? You have your input the data uh, matrix X and the adjacency matrix A. You perform a linear transformation uh, just like in the ordinary neural network. You take your X input and apply linearly an operator on it. The difference is that you use the adjacency matrix to act on the left side and the weight matrix W on the right side, W1, you add the bias, uh, appropriate size matrix to make it work. And then you apply your nonlinearity and two Ys and all these components. And this is the output of the first line. And you repeat the process from left to right. And there are different versions what to use for this A tilde. One version was to use a modified adjacency symmetric. You add identity to A. So adjacency symmetric, essentially, you add a self uh, edge or a self link to each node. That's what identity symmetric does. The neural network, graph neural network, could be, you know, some of them at least understood as taking a polynomial on the adjacency symmetric and acting with that one on your data matrix X and from layer to layer on the left. The, the good news about such architecture is that they are uh, flexible and versatile. They can deal with a variable number of nodes. So the same weight matrix W1, W2, WL. And uh, well, let's say almost bias matrices B would act on the variable number of nodes. The variable number of, I mean, the bias so what I'm going to do is that we're going to force the bias to be invariant to row permutations. 
and to do so, each bias metric is actually a column one times a row vector. In other words, you repeat the same row vector as needed, you know, number of nodes. Anyway, so so um, the key observation here is that when you conjugate AX like PAT transpose and PX, the output of the network conjugates with multiplication on the left. People call this equivariance, so you can also call it as post covariance because it's one change of coordinates. The uh, permutation or orthogonal matrix, um, you know, uh, satisfies or performs this uh, uh, change on the input chain of the output. Okay. Um, all right. So let me skip this one. Okay. So, uh, you know, all this motivation, let me actually get a little bit to the meat of the problem, right? So let's start with a set of tall matrices and by D, right? And the, the Frobenius, uh, the natural distance between equivalence classes, I said, is a minimum of, in this case, the Frobenius norm of the difference, x1 minus px2. So you try to align the rows in such a way that you minimize the distance, right? It's an alignment problem. Um, the minimum can be computed uh, relatively fast, and that's, uh, that's a good thing. So when you square, you expand the Frobenius norm, you end up that to minimize the difference is the same thing as maximizing, maximizing the trace of p times x2, x1 transpose. Okay, minimize the trace of this over permutation matrices. This is known as a linear assignment problem. And luckily is actually uh, solvable. The convex relaxation is exact in the sense that uh, provides you with the same uh, solution. So you can maximize the trace of W times X to X1 transpose over W, in this case, the set of W stochastic matrices because that's a convex uh, of, of the set of permutation matrices. So computing the natural distance is, is, is relatively fast. I mean, it's fast you end up with this convex optimization problem. Okay, that, that's good. So the problem, however, still remains, uh, how, do you, how do you embed, how do you represent the quotient space in a Euclidean space, right? In such a way that you distort distances as little as possible, okay? So that would be actually our main problem, how to perform this embedding. And specifically, that's what we want. We want to construct a map alpha from, let's say, n by d matrices to some RM space, find a constant L and or later on a constant uh, like this uh, little A over here, um, such that, well, the conditions one and two says that this alpha, the map alpha on matrices is actually, uh, can be lifted to uh, a uh, injective map on the quotient space. So two matrices X and X tilde are equivalent if and only if alpha X equal to alpha X prime. That's what conditions one and two, one and two say. Okay, so, and the uh, condition number three says that in fact the uh, Euclidean norm of the difference alpha X minus alpha X tilde is upper bounded by this constant times the natural distance between the two equivalent classes. So there's a Lipschitz condition on that. And alpha had the lift of this alpha. If you want by Lipschitz, well, in addition to this upper bound, you need to satisfy a lower bound as well. Alpha x minus alpha x still, I want to be bounded below by this constant a times natural distance. Okay, so that's a Lipschitz or by Lipschitz uh, problem to do this such embedding. Well, there is one uh, universal embedding, but unfortunately, it is not uh, very uh, uh, useful to us, and that is you can embed these data matrix or equivalence classes into the space of uh, probabilities probability measures, right? The problem with this one is that it's infinite dimensional. It's, otherwise, it's a nice convex set, but it belongs to linear space, but it's, uh, it's infinite dimensional. So that's not exactly what we want. Uh, however, we're gonna look at two type of uh, embeddings and two type of representations, which were actually inspired from um, deep learning. So the people in uh, uh, graph deep learning or some other areas call, so there is this particular paper called Deep Sets, uh, Zahir et al, a couple of years back. And, you know, I guess inspired by terminology from that paper, I'm gonna call one a pooling map and the other one is a without map. Essentially, the first one is based on max pooling, the second one is based on sum pooling. So here is the intuition as to what we want to do or what we're gonna do. For the max pooling, well, if, so this works in the case little d equal to one, right? Your uh, data matrix is just one column vector. The max pooling just simply order or sorts monotone decrease in your data vector. Okay. And the good, uh, okay. And I'm going to show in a moment that in fact, this sorting, this max pooling, it's, it's great 
is uh, it provides you the by Lipschitz embedding of a portion space. In fact, it's an isometric embedding, which is you know the best of all words, both words. Sampling, it's a different way of doing this. And what sampling does, you you choose a family of kernels new parameterized by the first parameter AK. And you compute, you apply in your data uh, values, xj inside your vector, and you sum over all the entries, right? Sum pulling the sum is because of the summation across the data vector. And you get to choose a kernel. You can choose, for instance, an exponential Gaussian type kernel, or you can choose a monomial. I'm going to make a comment in just a second by saying that, in fact, the monomial uh, kernels are very much. Uh, Related to and equivalent to an algebraic embedding of this uh, equivalence class. Okay. Now, our task and our problem would be to understand how much we can extend the max pooling and sum pooling philosophy, at least from d equal to one to d greater than one. You have multiple columns. What can you do? Okay. And here's the extension of the first approach of the max pooling or the pooling map, uh, max pooling map approach, right? Um, Let's say that, uh, recall your data matrix is uh, n by little d, right? And let's say that you fix a matrix capital R, okay? I'm gonna call later on this capital R a key, but you know, let's just call it for now capital R. You multiply your data matrix X on the right with this R. And what R is typically, it's a, it's a fat matrix. So the columns of R are a form in general a frame, okay? That's so, so, so uh, it's full rank, the matrix itself is full rank, the rows are linear independent, but you have more columns than rows, okay? And what you do is your data matrix X, firstly, you expand, so you embed in a redundant way in a larger dimensional space, that's what X times R does, but then you apply this uh, nonlinear operator which sorts monotone decrease in the columns, okay? And the hope is that this map, this lambda, capital lambda map, is going to provide a Lipschitz embedding, right? So, so this type of uh, uh, embedding is actually, if you think it's, a, it's similar to and inspired by the phase retrieval problem. The phase retrieval, what you have, you have your data vector, right? You apply, you expand with respect to a, a frame, which is a collection, the redundant collection of vectors. Okay, you get lots of coefficients, more coefficients than the dimension of the original space. And then you apply nonlinearity to lose the phase. Right, and in this case, well, you do exactly the same thing. X, you embed in a larger dimension space, and then you do this sorting, which is can you lose some information using a linear operator, right, on each column. Okay, and our hope is that such such a, uh, such a map capital lambda eventually would be uh, would provide you with a Lipschitz embedding. And now the good news is because of linearity or quasi locally linear uh, operator. If this is injective, if it's Lipschitz, uh, I mean, if it's injective, it's going to be Lipschitz, as you'll see in a moment, and then it's going to be by Lipschitz, in fact. So that would be you know, something that comes almost for free because of local linearity of your operator, as opposed to those nonlinear or algebraic embeddings. Okay, the fact that uh, it, it's in, invariant to row permutation, that's needed because of this sorting column wise. But in fact, you can uh, compute and check that uh, there is a Lipschitz constant here at play. That uh, uh, okay, so the the, the most you can uh, you can get right the variation the the two norm after you perform this uh, alignment. I mean, you can you can show that you get a Lipschitz constant. Yeah. The, the other one, so there are uh, some connections with the uh, kernels and reproducing kernel Hilbert space theory. I'm going to skip a little bit this one. What I like to you know, spend a few moments is about the polynomial uh, embedding, to be more specific about that. So in the equal to one case, as I mentioned, the monomials, the, the collection of monomials, uh, which are the sum right of xk square, so different powers of entries in your vector, those are in one to one correspondence, in fact, with the uh, polynomial of degree n, whose zeros are exactly your, uh, your data points, x1 to xn. Okay? But it's a one to one correspondence between them. So, what the monomials do, or what they provide, uh, in fact, they provide a representation of this polynomial that vanishes at those points, x1 to xn. 
And that's a way of embedding the set, but this is, you should think of set as a set with repetitions, right? So it's not exactly a set, it's more like a list uh, that contains x1 to x n, the data point, okay? The cap ends here should be little than one. Now for d greater than one, so how do we do this? Well, one suggestion, one idea is to embed your n d-dimensional vectors, right? Also as zeros of some polynomial. But if before you had polynomial and one variable, univariate polynomial that vanishes at those x1 to xn, well, now you have to have polynomials in d variables, which is a size of the row, number of columns, right? Each row is size d, it's a row d long vector. You have d variables, d1, d, d. And you construct, for instance, a quadratic polynomial that vanishes exactly at that particular row value, right? xk1 to xkd in the real space. And if you take a product of such things, well, you end up with a polynomial now in this d uh, variables of degree, well, would be 2n because you know, it's quadratic, as I mentioned. And these are about how many coefficients you have. And this one has exactly real zeros only at the collection of the rows of your original data. Set. Okay. So in other words, what you know, this expansion here provides you, it provides you with a algebraic embedding, right? You get the, the original X data matrix into a set of coefficients and you have this polynomial and it's guaranteed that if you have two data matrices, X and X tilde, that are first of all row equivalent, one is row permutation of the other, the collection of the zeros of these polynomials is the same, so you end up with the same polynomial, therefore with the same set of coefficients. On the other hand, if the set of zeros are distinct, are different somewhere, then some coefficients right should be different. So you do have at least an injective representation there. But this is about the complexity of this one. Now, there is a little bit of, uh, uh, I guess, improvement. You can, you can do a little bit of improvement here. You can notice that all these uh, quadratic uh, terms uh, involve z1 squared plus zd squared and then linear in z and so on. And um, so there is a, a, a dimensionality reduction you can easily perform. There is some invariance here. But I would like to instead, uh, Let's see, instead discuss something, uh, a different type of, uh, of, of in encoding. Um, yeah, and this would be the following. So to recognize that each uh, row in your uh, data matrix X can be encoded using uh, this linear form, right? Lambda K of Z1 to ZD, it's just a linear combination with those X, the row entries in here. And then you can construct a polynomial in a different variable P which have coefficients uh, uh, which are in terms are polynomials in this Z1, Z2, right? So you take the linear form lambda K, you take P minus formally, and then you take product, right? And this now becomes a polynomial if you want in P as well as Z1, Z2 variables in B plus one overall variable. You expand, but you can collect all the terms uh, according to the power of P, Pn minus and so on. And this E1 to EN are the elementary symmetric polynomials in the corresponding uh, variables, E1, DD. Um, I should say, event ends up to be in that one, right? I think actually they, they should have, I should have said that E1 to EN are polynomials, elementary symmetric polynomials in lambda one to lambda N that eventually expand in polynomials in E1, DD. Okay. And and you can collect every everything again together as a polynomial in Pn Z1 Zd. And uh, Pn is here, all the other terms, you have some coefficients here. Okay, you can count how many coefficients are actually needed to write this polynomial. And there is an expression here, this d plus n to the minus one. If you, you know, take the sum of uh, coefficients from those polynomials. And uh, you end up with a map that is injective modulo permutations, but unfortunately it's not Lipschitz. But there is an easy modification of this one to make it Lipschitz, and that's uh, a, in a very nice paper by Jameson, Cahill, and Waters, a couple of years back. Uh, they showed that you can you can make it Lipschitz by uh, adding, augmenting if you want the size by one, saving the norm of the data matrix into one component and then scale everything, for instance, inside to the unit ball 
if your data metrics already in the unit ball, you keep it there. Otherwise, you scale down, bring it down to the unit ball. Right? And essentially, this is what is described in this slide. I mean, you, you take your X metrics, you apply a scalar function uh, on the norm of X to scale your metrics X down to unit ball. You apply alpha zero, the map, the map we had before to this unit norm. Uh, normalize data matrix and save the actual norm of x in a different coordinate. So that's why you pay the price of increasing a little bit the dimension by one. But this alpha one here, though, it turns out to be Lipschitz, globally Lipschitz. And the Lipschitz constant is determined by the Lipschitz constant of the alpha zero, is a restriction on the unit ball of the map we said before. Okay. So, um, so that's about the uh, this part with the Lipschitz. Uh, yeah, so, and there is a discussion about minimality, but let me skip this one. Let me just uh, 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 say a few words about the sorting, right? So the sorting was to say you take your data matrix X, you multiply on the right by something, and then you order the columns. Well, there is a natural choice for something. Firstly, to keep X the way it is. So in other words, your key, your matrix are ahead before if you. You could uh, say that the first uh, d by d columns are likely to be identity, so I'm just sorting the columns of x. But then I add additional columns, which are this x times a. This a would be the I call it here the key. These additional columns, so that if you sort that one, this additional information would be sufficient to provide the information how to recover the class x unity. Okay. Okay. Um, so there are some. Uh, definitions here so the if you have a uh, uh, data matrix x this n by d we call a matrix a admissible the key if alpha uh, constructed with this matrix a is injective at x meaning that you apply alpha on x you have this uh, sorted uh, matrix a little n by cap d right and then if you pull back if you look at what what the uh, uh, matrices could have been mapped into alpha x, well, you get exactly the equivalence class of x. Okay, so in other words, it's injective at x. The pullback of alpha x is exactly the equivalence class, right? Or that's equivalent to say that if you have two data matrices x and y, uh, they are, uh, so, yeah. So firstly, the columns are uh, equivalent, each of them modulo permutation, that is to say, if you sort each column in X and in Y, you get the same matrix. And then you sort the columns in X times A and Y times A, you get the same thing. That's the alpha applied on X. Then this happens if and only if X and Y are equivalent matrices. So there is a permutation pi that is this on the left. That would mean the admissibility, right? The key for a given data matrix X. And vice versa. Uh, uh, if you fix a key A, you say a data matrix separated by A if, uh, if this condition holds true, right? In other words, the matrix A, the key is admissible for X. And our problem is to construct universal uh, keys. So universal keys means a matrix A such that the data uh, matrix that is separated by A is in fact all the set, the entire set of data matrix. That's, that's the point. Okay. So there are some algebraic, uh, yeah. So and here was just saying that the so little d equal to one, the sorting is by Lipschitz. In fact, it's an isometric embedding, which is great, right? I mentioned that earlier. Um, there are some uh, some results that say what you can do or what you cannot do. So there is a lot of uh, of room by saying that uh, uh, whenever you choose at least one additional column, uh, then almost every set is an admissible key for a given data matrix, which is, which is good. So that's that almost every key is admissible for a data matrix. Uh, on the other hand, there is a no-go result in the sense that if you only add one column though, so if, you're, if you choose a key, if you're looking for one additional column, well, that's never going to be universal. If you have more than two columns in your original data set and three or more rows in your, again, data matrix X, then you can always find a uh, data matrix uh, X such that, 
right? So that is not uh, separated from that particular uh, from that particular key. So uh, uh, yeah, so that's roughly speaking what this proposition says. So in other words, it's not sufficient to just add one column to to solve the problem. One column would not uh, would not provide you with a universal key. Okay, and there are some examples that would tell you what is the case, what the case here. So there is a uh, there is a description. So let me skip a little bit. Just getting to one, uh, you know, kind of a nasty looking formula. So there is a relationship that tells you the set. Uh, so S of A again, it's these are the uh, the separated data matrices, right? So you would want this separated, uh, the set of uh, separated uh, data matrices to be the whole space. Here is a characterization of the complex. So what data matrices are not separated by a given key A? Okay, and there is an equality. So you describe exactly the set. It's not just a simple inclusion, but it's an exact description of, of this set. A, the set A is universal, if and only if this complement is empty. Right, so what you want is that to make this complement as small as possible and basically empty an empty set. Okay, so what is a characterization? The characterization is going to be a union. The good news is that it's a finite union. It's a union over a bunch of permutation matrices. Okay, that depends on the little d, the cap d, and which of them it's an n permutation matrix, right? C and pi. But it's a finite union. And what do you what do we take the union of? Well, it's a difference between a linear space, the kernel of some linear operator, minus a union of other kernel uh, spaces. So another linear a union of other linear uh, spaces. Okay. So in the end, it's a finite union of difference between linear spaces and minus some other linear spaces. What this expression says is that. For instance, in, in terms of density, Zariski generic, uh, I mentioned Zariski generic, right? Some properties of the Zariski generic. Well, it's sufficient to show that uh, the difference here is either empty or a proper subspace. So it's a subspace of the RN by T, but not the whole space. Because at that point, you have a finite union, and therefore, what you get, you can end up at least with the most generic Zariski. Uh, subset of sorry you, you end up with a, a subset of a closed i should say that is the uh, uh, set of rn by d and if it's not empty the complement is generic okay and this so uh, this characterization of the complement eventually ends up to be key so uh, and there are some sort of a technical details to understand why and what do they is represent but it's just, it boils down to, to write down uh, conditions when you have uh, one data matrix and the second one, which is just a permutation. You just permute the rows of the first one, uh, but, uh, uh, right. And, and um, I should say, let me, let me step back. So you have two data matrices such that the image to this ordering sorting operator is the same. So A times, uh, sorry, X times A and Y times A when you sort, you get exactly the same, uh, the same vectors. And yet the two matrices uh, X and Y are not equivalent, right? This is actually the, the, the class of uh, data matrices which are not separated by A. And if you just write down those conditions are linear algebra conditions, you end up with such a set. Okay, that description, so, as I said, if, if you believe it the way it's written there, it allows you, however, to construct the by Lipschitz map. That's the good news. So, how to construct the by Lipschitz map? What you have to do is to uh, is to extend the the original dimension literally to, to a capital D in the following way. So, so here the the key I call it again capital A. This stands for the capital R in the previous slides. It's a D by you know, a number of columns, the capital D columns, in such a way that uh, the columns of the matrix A form a frame, in fact, form a full spark frame, okay? So, uh, so what does this mean? It means that any collection of little d columns of capital A is linearly independent, 
right? So if you if you choose such a huge now the number of balance of capital B is huge. It's n factorial times something that depends on the little v, little v minus one n factorial plus one. So there's a huge price to pay in redundancy. You have a redundant embedding of your original data set x by x times a. Okay, and you sort monotone decreasing the columns of this product. Okay, this is what the beta help map does. Well, this one, when capital A, uh, it's a matrix whose columns form a full part frame, is guaranteed to provide a bilipids embedding of your portion set. That's a good news, right? The bad news is that the, the number of columns is huge. I mean, it's n factorial and more, right? That's a price to pay here. Okay, so this is, uh, this is what uh, we were able to prove Right, that is to say, construct and show that at least there exists a finite universal field that does the trick. Now, this doesn't mean by you know by no means that this is a minimal uh, dimension. It just shows that there exists one. Uh, now, on the other hand, we I try we tried numerically to see what happens. Uh, you know, if you uh, if you just generate a random matrix A of some sizes, can you? Is it possible still to get a universal key based on that, right? And the code that I have, it only works for a small number of uh, size n, that is for two, three, and four, right? And the little d like two in this case. And the actual number, the additional number of columns that you need to add to make it to universal is described here. So one and then two and two would work, but even for dimension five and equal to five, I don't know what happens. So you have a five by two data matrix, right? I don't know exactly how many columns would be needed to, to make it work. Now, the good news is that in theory, there exists an algorithm that uh, would provide you with the answer, right? The, whether that complement set is empty or not. If it's empty, then you know this is a universal set. If it's not, then it is it's not a universal uh, key, as you say. And you, you might need to go to an additional color, right, to check. And that's that's uh, that's actually a uh, topic that we'd like to uh, study back over the summer, and it's a it's a project that uh, Daniel Levy and myself are gonna have hopefully over the summer, and who knows maybe we can cover at least you know small values of n five five six you know to we'll see how much we can push it. Okay, so that's about the the sorting, um, and I know that I just have a few minutes. I have numerics I can show, but instead I prefer to do something else. Uh, do I have like five more minutes? Uh, yeah, look good. Okay. Uh, so instead I like to, 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 to talk about something else, and that is the case of the symmetric matrices, because I, I think that's, uh, you know, that's interesting and it's highly non trivial in some sense. All right. So just to fix notation in the case of symmetric matrices, what's, um, uh, what are things here? So the C-man denotes the set of n by n symmetric matrices. Uh, this is a vector space of this dimension, and n plus one over two. Uh, the permutation group acts uh, by the similarity transformation, as I mentioned earlier, TAT transpose. And um, the, uh, uh, the natural metric here is A minus P, B, P transpose of Frobenius norm. So computing this, uh, the actual matrix, the distance is actually pretty hard because that goes to the quadratic assignment problem, right? As opposed to the previous case, which was a linear assignment problem. And the problem is to construct the by Lipschitz map, for instance, this beta hat, uh, which is you start with the beta on the symmetric matrices, and then you want to be faithful with respect to this equivalence class, and then by Lipschitz is possible. Okay. Now, what I like to uh, discuss for these few minutes is. Uh, only the uh, uh, the uh, polynomial representation, right? The algebraic embedding is possible, and that's actually a, a joint work that uh, we recently started, uh, Stato, Stukanis, and myself. And um, so, let me tell you what. Uh, how does this uh, problem look like? So, I'm going to take just the next few minutes to, to discuss this in the next slide, I think, or next two slides. And what we want, we want to find those polynomials, in fact, invariant symmetric polynomials in n square variables, writing these variables x11 to xnn. These are the entries in the matrix A, which are invariant with respect to the, the action of the permutation group by the group of permutation matrices. Uh, so I will denote such a polynomial, uh, basically Q of A, right? The A is 
is a n by n matrix. And Q of A is a polynomial in the entries of this matrix A. And the fact that Q is uh, invariant and symmetric means the following, that Q of A is the same as Q of A transpose, okay, for all uh, n by n uh, matrices. And the second is that Q of pi A pi transpose is equal to Q of A, right? That's, that's invariance with respect to the action of the permutation group. Okay, you can, I mean, there is a, you know, theory more than a century now old, going back to Nutter and uh, Hilbert, of course, and that's, you know, a number of other people studied. This is a kind of a well-studied area in commutative algebra to describe invariant polynomials to the action of groups, finite groups, and other groups, bio, bio quantity, compact groups, and, and so on. So it's known that this, uh, um, this algebra of polynomials is finitely generated. So it's a materiality property of it. You can also notice and ob uh, obtain that is graded, meaning that you can write it as a direct sum uh, over the degree. H of B denotes the vector space of homogeneous polynomials of a specific degree B. Now, I have not put a slide here, but it's an interesting question to compute so called the Hilbert series. The Hilbert series would be a formal power series with the dimension of this HB. Okay, and that, that would give us actually quite a bit of information about this. Uh, so my, my purpose in the next few minutes is to describe this HD, the vector space of homogeneous polynomials, right, of degree B, invariant to, to the action of permutation matrices for small values of B, or at least tell you what we know or some part of that we know about this HD. Now, in general, if you have a homogeneous polynomial of degree B in entries of A, you can always write it, if you think about it, as a trace of W, some big weight matrix W times the tensor product of A. So that, what, what this formula here, actually, if, if you think about it, it combines what we were calling earlier or some years back, the lifting in the phase retrieval problem. That quadratic part, you can always write it like this with the tensor product. And uh, the W, the weight matrix, uh, W here, it's a big matrix. It's an MD by MD. Now, the fact that Q is invariant and symmetric, it tells you the following. The W should be a symmetric matrix. And then W should commute with the tensor product of these permutation matrices, pi, tensor pi, D, couple of pi. Right? So in other words, uh, W being symmetric and commuting with the permutation matrix says that W should belong to the Hamilton of the algebra generated by the tensor product of permutation matrices. Okay. If you call C sub B the Hamilton of this algebra, so you take all the permutations, you take this product, the tensor product of, of this permutation matrix pi, uh, CD is going to be a vector space, going to be in fact an algebra, and that contains exactly all these Ws. And that algebra can be identified as HD as the same dimension, and the generator from CD or the basis from CD is going to give you a basis for HD. And in fact, there exist uh, some descriptions for lower dimensional low values of B. For B equal to one, dimension of the C1 turns out to be two. Okay, and the basis for for the space for the Hamilton and then for this invariant polynomials. So the base is given by the identity as well as by this rank one matrix, one times one transpose. And a basis, uh, so the linear form, which are invariant to permutations and uh, asymmetric, is a trace of A and basically the sum of all entries in A. These are the two, the only two linear and invariant forms. Uh, yeah, linear forms over A, right, the invariant to the permutation group. Uh, so, such a result, you know, showed up actually in literature. Uh, Jeff Schneider and the collaborators a couple of years back uh, in a uh, machine learning conference. They they kind of analyzed this without necessarily using the Hamilton uh, uh, language, but it's still there somewhere. Uh, now, um, so uh, if you if you call capital D the diagonal matrix. A, uh, formed by taking the row sum of the entries in A matrix. So this diagonal matrix is actually interesting. It's important. That's how you construct the graph Laplacian with D minus A, right? And the uh, one of the advantages or one property of this D matrix is that if you conjugate your adjacency matrix with pi, 
B also conjugate in the same pi in the same way. So both A and B conjugate uh, with a permutation matrix pi in the same way. Okay. And uh, <clears throat> this covariance property allows you to in fact, construct a large class of invariant symmetric polynomials, take trace of products. And, and again, if you think a little bit about it, this covers the cases of uh, the spectrum of graph Laplacian as well as the spectrum of the Gaussian symmetrics are covered by, by these uh, polynomials, trace of these uh, products, right? And actually, th that was a uh, you know, plausible conjecture I had some while back saying that it's possible that trace this type of polynomials actually might be sufficient, maybe to find a complete set of invariants for the problem. Well, unfortunately, the answer is no. And for d equal to two, in fact, that's what we uh, realized recently, the dimension of H2 turns out to be seven, okay? And whereas if you look here, there are only three generators that can define invariant polynomials. And obviously you need to have, you have many more invariant polynomials than those that are obtainable from this form, right? So, so it's clear that this constructs a set of invariants, but it's not a complete set of invariants. The actual dimensions of HD, so I, we don't know exactly what they are. We have some ideas about, you know, you know I guess for HD and H4 perhaps conjecture, but uh, we're not exactly sure what that is. So we actually played a little bit with that, uh, what's called the online encyclopedia, right, of sequence of integers based on the Sloan's sequence, right, of the game of Sloan's, as uh, some other people in frames. Uh, also play with the similar um, and uh, exactly. And um, uh, so we kind of match a few possible sequences based on the four numbers that we have, right? And kind of we tried from all possible definitions. I mean, we have the definition of the partition. There's still a set partition that we, we can construct, but it didn't exactly match in existing literature whether that is the right you know, sequence or not. But that's pretty much all right. Okay, so, and the rest of slides are numerics. Obviously, I don't want to, to bother you with that. Uh, you know, there are some of that. I'd rather stop here and I'll take questions instead because time's up. Very good. Uh, thanks, Radu. Uh, everyone, be sure to smash that reaction icon to express your appreciation. And uh, I'll stop the recording here for questions. <laughs>